Running on Empty. Written and narrated by Butterfly Coffee and produced for audio by Mr Judge. Britain was facing a crisis. Because of the war in North Africa and the Far East, every fit man had been called away to fight. They had had to leave relatives, family and their work behind. Without key sectors of industry running, such as farming for food and mines for coal, the country was close to grinding to an absolute standstill. This is where the women had come in. Just as they had done in the Great War, women from all over the country stepped up to the task of handling the work required of them. The railway was no exception. Apart from the role of driver or fireman, women filled every single job available to them, no matter what it was. Station announcer, porter, guard, and even dirtier jobs like cleaner or fitter. Nothing seemed to stop them. One morning, Caitlin groggily woke to the sound of the main yards bustling more than usual. As her vision cleared, a cleaner approached her. This cleaner looked different to the Jinty. He looked more buxom in shape and had a bright red cloth wrapped around his head. It wasn't until the cleaner was working on Caitlin did she realise, Hang on a minute, you're a woman! The cleaner laughed. <laughs> I'd be rather shocked to find I wasn't she replied, oiling Caitlin's motion and checking her gauges ready for work. I didn't think women worked on the railway, Caitlin mused. Well, since my child is in school and my husband was conscripted, I had to do something with myself. I couldn't just cope myself up at home when we have a war to win. I felt like I had to do my part. Well, that's very brave of you. I just feel like I'm doing what I have to do. It can be very scary sometimes. We all just have to grin and bear it, I suppose, the cleaner sighed. She suddenly began to falter in her work, pausing to say, Excuse me, but I think I recognise you from somewhere. You do? Caitlin asked. I believe so. When I was given the number of the engine from the clerk, I recognised it from somewhere, but I wasn't sure. Just a moment. Caitlin found the cleaner hurrying to the front and beginning to wipe away at her face brushing off some of the grime, dust and dirt before hopping down. The bright face with blue eyes suddenly broke into a wide smile. Well, I'll be. Now I know where I've seen you. You were the engine who rescued my little Kathleen. Caitlin frowned, trying to remember what the woman meant. Then she knew. This was the mother of the small girl she'd rescued. The Jinty was overjoyed. Oh my fowler, she gasped. It's nice to meet you, Miss... Uh. Her face slightly fell. Never mind with the formalities, smiled the cleaner. Call me Margie. Everyone back home did. The two continued to talk until the jinty was collected by her crew, the cleaner jovially shouting to bring her back safely. She left the sheds in a very good mood, just as Duchess arrived back from another stopping passenger run. What's gotten little Caitlin so lively? The 2P wondered. Well, you know women. Once they gab, they don't stop gabbing, remarked her driver. I say! Oh, sorry old horse. The driver quickly excused himself when Duchess harumphed at him. Let's get you off to the coaling stage. As Duchess made her way across the maze of track, she also noticed the yards were bustling a little more than usual. Her crew watched the women hurrying around, gracefully minding oncoming traffic and damaged track to accommodate the busyness of the yards. At last it was made clear what was happening. A new shipment of coal had arrived in the early hours of that morning and was just finishing being loaded into the hopper at the coaling stage. The driver was hopeful. Oh, that's grand, he chortled. Fingers crossed most of it will actually be coal this time. Don't speak so soon, Frank, warned the fireman. Remember our engines aren't the only things that rely on coal. Most of it goes to the Navy. Our last lot was awful, so I suspect we'll have to deal with another one. Duchess hoped that wouldn't be the case as she came to a halt at the stage. The fireman scrabbled up onto the tender to check that everything was in order and inquired about the state of the coal. 
he soon grimaced. The women working the stage told him exactly what he'd hoped not to hear. The coal was another poor lot. The best of it had gone to the Navy again, leaving the railways to cope with what was left. The fireman looked hopelessly on as a column of black dust poured into his engine's tender. That's not all, groaned one of the workers, tossing the fireman a dull looking and dusty grey brick. She looked apologetic as he cried aloud. They aren't. They are. But, but they can't. The fireman was incredulous. You wouldn't put these wretched things in the fire at home, never mind the firebox of a locomotive. The war department have got to be having us on. It's either them or no fire at all, the woman grouched, grimly turning back to her work. The fireman miserably climbed back down to the cab, clutching the ugly brick to him. He sadly opened his hands to the driver. This is what I have to work with now, he moaned, breaking the grey brick in two without really meaning to. You're having a laugh, said the driver in disbelief. We can't be using briquettes of all things. Briquettes were large slabs of compressed coal dust and other types of fuel that were used in place of the real thing. Firemen hated using them, as they would crumble very easily and kick up a fine powdery dust which would go everywhere and make life in the cab difficult. Crews couldn't breathe properly and their eyes would weep something fierce. Both men would rather deal with coal the size of oxo cubes than briquettes, but the choice wasn't theirs. They had to take what they were given. Of course, as the day drew on, Duchess found herself unable to steam properly. She began coughing at every stop, and her funnel was spewing thick black smoke, rather than the white plumes everyone was used to seeing. Her firebox had a rasping tickle, and her boiler tubes felt stuffed with ash and soot. The dust seemed to be everywhere, on her footplate, in the cab, on her face. The 2P soon found herself in quite a mess. She wasn't even at Exeter before she was violently hacking alongside her crew. All three of them were in quite a terrible state. <coughs> the driver coughed as he struggled to breathe amongst all the dust flying around. This one's almost as <coughs> bad as the... <coughs> Damned industrial, said the fireman as he threw in another load of dust. Only difference is I've got space to swing me shovel. Duchess struggled on. This usually easy train was now very difficult and near to unbearable. She was used to flying around at 60 or even 70 miles per hour at best, even on bad coal. However, with this lot, she could barely get up to 40. The black smoke continued to pour as Duchess kept hissing and wheezing. It was an awful noise. Driver, my gauge frames feel odd, she suddenly said, feeling the sharp twinge at the back of her firebox. But despite their best efforts, they couldn't see anything. It would help if there wasn't <coughs> powdered coal covering everything, the fireman grumbled. Be jolly helpful if there was a steam leak, old mare, the driver responded. Whatever it is, it will have to wait to the next station. <coughs> Great Darby Axel boxes, could this day get any worse? Duchess whispered hoarsely to herself. It could. A mile outside Bath. It happened. A sudden jolt in the rails was followed by a horrendous roaring coming from the cab. The 2 was screeched to a halt. The driver stumbled down, covering his face and screaming in agony. Duchess's water gauge had burst, and the glass flew with scalding hot water and steam in all directions, including the driver's face. Duchess looked on in horror as her driver continued crying out. She could do nothing but sit and wait, while her fireman had to brave the jet of steam and isolate the gauge frame. Once he'd told the guard what had happened, he sprinted like a jackrabbit up the line to the signal box. 
Soon enough, her train was taken over and she was shunted into Bath's workshops to have her gauge mended. I simply don't believe it! Mr. Turner gawped after Bath MPD had rang to tell him the news. Having the same gauge glasses for four months?! This is tantamount to negligence at best and sheer laziness at worst. Duchess was out of action for six days while her gauge was replaced. Some engines by this point had been on nothing but dust and briquettes for a week, and they were all worse for it. They were dirtier, grumpier, and tired more easily. Their crews weren't looking so well either. With ashen faces and puffy, weeping eyes, every driver and fireman agreed that they hated those briquettes something rotten. Pretty soon, they began throwing anything that could possibly be burnt into their engine's fireboxes. It didn't matter what it was. Coal from the home, pieces of kindling, oily cloths, grasses and logs from the line side. Anything had to be better than those godforsaken briquettes. As the dusk of another day drew in, the engines were all very vocal about their views on the poor lot of coal and the briquettes. Cleaners who had stayed behind to clean the carriages had overheard the engines' distress and come to comfort them. It's nothing short of despicable for the standard we are working to, Duchess wheezed. She felt as though the side of her boiler had been hit with a sledgehammer and struggled to speak. <coughs> How do you expect us to do our bloody jobs when you can't even give us the right coal? <coughs> Hercule added. It's not fair, Caitlin whimpered. <coughs> Doesn't matter if it's not fair. Do what you can and keep your head down, Busy said quietly. Lizzie, I am surprised at you, Louise gasped. I expected you to be far angrier. Where's your fighting spirit? Lizzie met Louise with an almost lifeless stare. It was as if no one was actually sitting on that road. My fighting spirit up and left when I saw some poor young man get shot in the head in 1918. Besides, <coughs> these damn briquettes and even this damn war seem to be draining she continued calmly. I can't be angry at something I don't have the power to stop. Louise tried to counter, but found herself shocked into silence. The auto tank couldn't think of anything appropriate to say. One of the cleaners gave her a gentle pat on the buffer. There, there, 4820. 5322 has a point. Lizzie. Beg pardon, old girl. Lizzie has a point. No one will be the same person they were by the time this all ends. We're all learning an awful lot about ourselves by slogging it out in this war. I say it's times like this that build the most character. Indeed, said Louise quietly. Lizzie's vacant stare had shaken her a little, and the memories of the out-of-use line were still fresh in her mind. Trust me, said the cleaner. This is the worst it's going to get, and then we'll all be stronger for it. After all this is over, nothing will get the better of us. You'll see. If you say so, muttered Lizzie. Caitlin looked worriedly over to Joe as the other engines continued to debate or bicker. The industrial seemed to be frozen with the same tired and depressed look she held. What do you think, Joe? She asked. Joe looked blank. I don't know, Caitlin. He said at last in a weary tone. I genuinely don't know what to think. I'm just too tired to. I'm used to running on bad coal, but not this stuff. This is too much. I swear, if I get one more hot axle box, my wheels are going to fall off. I'm not so sure about all this talk, to be frank with you. A cleaner remarked as she leant back on Joe's running plate, running a grimy hand through her frizzled greying hair. Does nothing but give me the willies. It's 
Do you think something good can come from the war? Caitlin asked quietly. I doubt it, replied the cleaner. Look at what's come already. Death, damages, loss, struggles and more death. Something has to be shown for it at the end of the day, said Joe in a confused manner. He wouldn't be working so hard otherwise, right? I thought the same thing in the Great War, the cleaner grunted. Something has to happen, I told myself. Good men don't die for nothing. As it turns out, they did die for nothing. So those Germans went up and ruined everything again. Beastly Nazi swines, a lot of them. <laughs> Joe and Caitlin gave each other uncomfortable quick glances, silently asking the other if they'd actually heard the cleaner correctly. The two engines then saw the woman sigh heavily and scuffed the ballast with a shoe before starting to walk away. <coughs> oh well, you know men. She coughed at them. Time to kill a man for sport and they'll have the whole country. The tank engines were a little worried by that statement. That couldn't be right, could it? No, it couldn't. It seemed wrong in a way. Especially to Caitlin. Most men wouldn't be fighting to kill, but to defend. Germany was the one who'd started everything, Britain was trying to stop it. Some men from both countries might be like that, yes, but not all of them, surely. It just sounded unfair. After weeks of coal dust, ash, grit, tears and sweat, it seemed like things were turning out a little better. The women were still jovial enough to keep morale consistent. The engines still tried to give it their all every day. Before long, more coal had been delivered. There were still a few briquettes in the mix, but the vast majority was indeed coal. It wasn't brilliant, but crews reported that at least it wasn't dust compacted into a brick. In spite of it all, the engines of Newton Abbott were at least able to start picking up the strain of work effectively. Maybe, just maybe, they'd be able to keep calm and carry on for the country once again. Hey, don't go away just yet. Thank you all so much for being so patient with waiting for Running on Empty to arrive. It means a lot to me and Mr. George. And, have you ever wanted to interact with other fans of the series or ask me and Mr. George questions directly as a more behind the scenes thing? Now you can! I'm launching an NAS Discord. The link to join will be in the description. Hope to see you all there!